Hi team, welcome to this screencast where we're focusing on recapping some of the concepts from Level 2 PE. This presentation we're looking at biomechanics and we'll be discussing Newton's laws, levers, force summation and projectiles. All stuff that you should have covered at Level 2. Sir Isaac Newton was a famous scientist who developed three basic laws that explain the relationship between motion and force. Uh, those three laws are the law of inertia, the law of acceleration and the law of reaction. And that's a nice little uh, painting of Sir Isaac Newton there on the right. Newton's first law states that a body continues in its state of rest or uniform motion unless an unbalanced force acts upon it. Inertia is the body's tendency to remain at rest or in motion. The more mass an object has, the larger, larger its inertia and the more reluctant it is to change its state of rest or motion. To explain Newton's first law, imagine that you have three ramps set up as shown in the image here. Also imagine that the ramps are infinitely long and infinitely smooth. You let a marble roll down the first ramp, which is set as a slight incline. The marble speeds up on its way down the ramp. Now you give a gentle push to the marble going uphill on the second ramp. It slows down as it goes up. Finally you push a marble on a ramp that represents the middle state between the first two. In other words, a ramp that's perfectly horizontal. In this case, the marble will neither slow down nor speed up. In fact, it should keep rolling forever. Newton's law of acceleration states that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force causing it, is in the same direction as the force, and is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. In other words, the more force used to move an object, the larger its acceleration will be in the direction the force was applied. A less massive object will accelerate more than a more massive object for the same given force. Newton's second law can be summarised by the following equation. Force equals mass times acceleration. The equation form of Newton's second law allows us to specify a unit of measurement for force. Scientists decided to use a newton as the official unit of force. One newton, or n, is equivalent to one kilogram metre per second squared. So what can you do with Newton's second law? As it turns out, force equals mass, mass times acceleration lets you quantify motion of every variety. Let's say, for example, you want to calculate the acceleration of the dog sled shown on the left here. If you want to calculate the acceleration, first you need to modify the force equation to get A equals F divided by M. When you plug the numbers in for force, which is 100 newtons, and mass, 50 kg, you find that the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. If you look at the sled on the right, notice that doubling the force by adding another dog doubles the acceleration. So if the mass of the sled stays at 50 kg and we assume that the second dog pulls with the same force as the first, which was 100 newtons, the total force would be 200 newtons and the acceleration would be 4 meters per second squared. Newton's law of reaction states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, whenever a force is applied to move something, there will be an equal and opposite force going in the other direction. The best way to explain this is that every force involves the interaction of two objects. When one object exerts force on a second object, the second object also exerts a force on the first object. These, the two forces are equal in strength and, and oriented in opposite directions. Consider a, considering a swimmer facing the wall of a pool, if he places his feet on the wall and pushes hard, what happens? He shoots backwards away from the wall. Clearly the swimmer is applying a force to the wall but his motion indicates that a force has been applied to him too. This force comes from the wall and it's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now onto levers. Levers are simple machines which help to apply force and speed more easily. Levers help to move greater loads with a set amount of force and also move loads at greater speeds. All levers involve five parts. Force Resistance, a resistance arm, a force arm, and a fulcrum. There are three classes of levers which can be either external or internal. External examples include rackets, pedals, or oars, 
while internal examples utilize joints, muscles and bones as parts of the lever. Most levers within the human body are third class levers. Looking at the image here, pause the video and see if you can come up with a real world example of each of the three classes of levers. Force summation allows maximum forces to be produced by the muscles and then transferred into physical activity movements. This is achieved by adding the forces of each body segment together, producing a larger force than possible if only one body part was used. It's really important when generating force for a movement that each body segment accelerates at the correct time. The correct time for this to happen is when a body segment reaches peak force, which is indicated by the black dot on the image. Correct timing allows maximum transfers of force between body parts. This image represents a highly coordinated effort where all body segments accelerate at the right time. In the real world this doesn't always happen, particularly when learning a new skill. In this situation the performer may get one or more segments accelerating too late, too early, early or in the correct order. Let's see what happens if the hips in this image accelerate too late and miss the transfer of momentum after missing peak force. As you can see, the resulting level of performance indicated along here has decreased significantly and also the timing how long the skill takes to perform you can see there that it's taken longer than the original movement. So by simply uh, mistiming the transfer of momentum you've seen, a, you've seen on this graph there's a, there's a dramatic decrease in the level of performance any object released into the air is termed a projectile. The flight path of a projectile consists of a vertical component, shown here, and a horizontal component. From that, you get the fl flight path of the projectile. Regardless of the type of object that has been released or by what means it has been projected, um, all projectiles are governed by the same basic principles. Six factors affect the flight path of projectiles. These are gravity, air resistance, speed of release, angle of release, height of release, and spin. Gravity acts upon a body to give it mass. The greater the weight of an object, the greater the influence of gravity upon it. Gravity affects the shot put value Adams throws by acting on the horizontal component. This causes it to decrease in height quickly. Air resistant acts on the horizontal component of a projectile's path. The badminton shot is a good example here because the shuttlecock highlights a few other key factors regarding air resistance. If the surface of an object is rough, air resistance will be greater. The smaller the mass, meaning the lighter the object, the more air resistance will affect it. These factors play a role in the characteristic flight path of a shuttlecock which shoots off the racket quickly before slowing and dropping to the floor. Speed of release is divided into two components, initial vertical velocity and initial horizontal velocity. A higher initial vertical velocity will result in a longer flight caused by more height. A higher initial horizontal velocity will result in a longer flight time and better distance. Pause the video now and name two sports, one suited to a higher initial vertical velocity and one suited to a higher initial horizontal velocity. For any given speed of release, the optimum angle of release is always 45 degrees. This assumes that there is no air resistance and that the landing and takeoff points are at the same height. In sporting situations, the angle of release is usually always lower, around 35 or between 35 and 45 degrees. This is mainly due to air resistance of the body. Height of release of a projectile affects the speed and angle of it. 
In activities such as tennis, it is important to achieve maximum height of release so that the ball can travel in a more downward direction while still clearing the net. With a smaller height of release, the ball travels further and takes longer to reach the opposition court. However, with a larger height of release, the ball travels in a more downward direction, making it harder for the opposition to return as they have less time to react. As a projectile spins, one side spins in the same direction as that of the incoming airflow. This creates a low pressure zone. The other side spins in the opposite direction, creating a high pressure zone. Therefore, range is decreased with top spin and increased with back spin. That's it for this session. Make sure you take some good notes, summarise well and come to the next class with a good question prepared.